Paul Fournier is a Canadian artist who is associated with the third generation of abstract modernist painters. He has worked and exhibited along many artists such as Jack Bush, Kenneth Nolan and David Baldock. Although associated with these people, he has managed to find a unique and personal style of painting which is fluid and emotional. Paul had his first solo exhibition in the late 50s and has had countless group and solo exhibitions since. From Simcoe, Ontario, where he was born, Paul moved to study printmaking at McMaster's University and then became the artist in residence at the Waterloo Lutheran University in the 60s and 70s. It was here that he began to experiment with abstraction. Paul's work is widely collected by both private and public collections, including the National Gallery of Canada, the Art Gallery of Ontario, and the Hershorn Museum and Sculpture Gardens in Washington, just to name a few. Well, it's very, uh, but my, uh, let's say, development as an artist uh, started, you know, I lived in Hamilton, Ontario, which uh, was in Toronto. And uh, so you're very, in those days, certainly very limited to basically mm -hmm. the archive of Hamilton, which, uh, you know, and sometimes at Master University, would put shows and they took an interest in uh, what I did. But in wow. those early years, and I was sort of in my late teens, early 20s, um, it was more a mix because the library in Hamilton was, you know, I, other than the, the art of Hamilton, uh, was my only place of going and seeing what was happening in the world as far as painting and art is concerned. So there are these big, fat Skira books, which is sort of like Abrams or uh, Rizzoli or today, you know, make big coffee table books on famous arts or art movements, whether it's de Kooning or, or the abstract expressionists or other movements. And so I would take these home and I basically studied and educated myself and I got to know various types, especially the School of Paris uh, and Europe and, and, and New York School and Americans and, and the Automatis School. And, uh, you know, eventually I did get to Toronto as an art student. And I got to see, you know, William Ronald, Harold Town, uh, Graham Coftree, Gordon Rayner, uh, Michael Snow, all these people at at, uh, at Isaac's gallery, so it was like being totally, sub, you know, <laughs> submerged in all these phenomenal new experiences of seeing these paintings by, you know, in some cases, great artists. Uh, you know, I, I, it's always overwhelming, and so you would, and uh, my love for, of course, Turner and Constable and landscape painting, it all collided together with all these abstract images, but you can get different types of abstraction. And so uh, I had all these things to look at and stimulate me as a, a young person in 2021. And, uh, you know, so I would end up having everything from representational work, and I was doing drawings at the time, which were less abstract, more to do with uh, Napopolic, the type of subject matter, very full of angst and, and very dark, things like that. Mm -hmm. But then I would jump over and, you know, start it into another direction. And so you would, my first show at uh, the uh, Westone Gallery in Hamilton, I think in 1962, uh, we had everything from little landscapes to you know, drawings of, uh, of figures and things. Uh, and you get also abstract stuff, uh, which was more akin to the automatis, uh, of like Bourdieu, especially uh, in that era. So I, I, I sort of uh, came out of abstract expression, expressionism and the automatis. And out of Toronto, I would say, William Ronald and Graham Coftree, in their, each in their own ways, influenced me a bit. But these are influences you go through, and, and they don't totally like submerge you. Uh, you know, my work always would look like mine for the most part. But uh, I th 
think art builds on art and influences can come in from time to time where you, you know, are using a certain aspect of an artist that you really admire, but you're building on it. You're not just trying to copy it. You're building on it and try it. And your own persona, your own personality as an artist comes through. People walking in and say, oh, that's Paul Fournier. Even though it might have some influences of other art uh, or other artists. But I've always found that my greatest influence is really the subject of, in nature. And uh, so, you know, my sense of relating uh, my painting to natural phenomena is naturally going to lead me into a more abstract world, but at the same time, make me relate more to something that people sense is perhaps, uh, if I can't say realistic, but certainly uh, figurative or a relationship that they can relate to. Um, and it's a, it's a difference between, I wouldn't call myself a totally abstract painter in a non-objective way. Uh, there's always some relationship uh, to the natural world, whether it's astrophysics or coral reefs or something like that. Whereas if I'm like in talking about, let's say, uh, the present painting that you have there, Red Genesis, uh, I the Genesis aspect itself is one of the, the creative explosion. Uh, which, you know, uh, I have a christ Center worldview, so I'm more biblically based in a lot of my uh, inspiration. And so uh, I take it where, you know, there was a, a time frame where all this wonderful creative activity went on. And I have a painting that I called Dawn of the Third Day. And it, again, is part of the creative story as emulated in Genesis. So Genesis, the Genesis aspect of these paintings is more the creation of the world and the, the creation of things in the world. And uh, I sort of take that on and as a painter. It's not that I'm trying to create fish or <laughs> birds or flowers or something. Uh, I'm trying to create shape that's intriguing, mm -hmm. and then the shapes themselves sort of explode and, and create other shapes. And painting in, in itself is a, a, a story all on its own, each painting, and, and it has a life of its own, and you have many deaths and resurrections in it, mm -hmm. and changes, and sometimes there are, you know, many paintings underneath the finished painting. And they come through in different ways. Each one tends to, even if it's just a texture here, a little texture there, a little form there, but they all begin to build into so, stages. It's not like very often it's a one-shot kind of thing. You know, a lot of the techniques I employed over the years, because uh, I like to explore all kinds of aspects of painting, and some lead more to, uh, you know, being more related to nature. And, and, and part of what intrigues me with paint is its relationships to uh, nature itself and, and the phenomena within nature. For instance, uh, as an example, of the satellite photographs of Earth from way up there, you get phenomenal things. You look at that, if you never knew what, what the source was or how this was done, you know, many times you think, oh, that looks like a, an abstract painting. And, and whether it's even astrophysics, or looking through a telescope or looking through a microscope. I mean, the microscopic world is phenomenal. And you have all these sources to, that influence us that artists prior to the 20th century certainly didn't have these influences. You know, what would Turner do if he could go up in an airplane? Just, uh, it's just so exciting. And so we have all these images coming at us. And for people to expect, well, why would you, why should you not just paint the real world? Well, I am, in a sense, 
being influenced by more than just what my eyes perceive. Mm -hmm. The telescopes amplify my ability to see the universe, both micro and macro. So why should I be put into a corner or shackled to just paint in one way? Or you'd be surprised, Glenn Bringer, the critic, you know, I went, he kindly allowed me to go look at his collection years ago. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of representational art there. And, you know, I, I, it's not a question of whether representational art is better than abstraction. And Clem Greenberg never said that, uh, you know, uh, because he promoted abstract art, that it was way better than representational art or realism. He said at the moment he just felt it was the best stuff being done in the world. But that doesn't mean it, it, it necessarily is, is better than realism, but realism is better than abstraction. I think it depends on the artist and the art and, 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 and the importance uh, that it makes in society. You know, my movement through, um, I guess, from realism or representationalism into abstraction, it wasn't so, wasn't a clean cut, clear line. It had many different offshoots. And, uh, I did many different things in the early 60s. And finally, in the mid 60s, I settled down to maybe doing more uh, uh, landscapes. And people looking at my work might relate some of it to Turner. But a lot of that is simply, I happen to like things in the mist coming out of ambiguity, you might say. I mean, Turner loved ambiguity ambiguous subject to know it's just ambiguity is what his heart's all about. Even up to this day, I tend to like things that are somewhat indistinct or seem to be coming out of a fog. Mm -hmm. And uh, so with the work that's uh, Red Genesis that you have, um, you know, it, it sort of grabs all of that kind of uh, what I've been talking about, at least. It's not as uh, foggy it's more distinct than that, more like an explosion. I mean, mm -hmm. not all my work is ambiguous necessarily. Sometimes it's the opposite. But, uh, you know, I'm just trying to give different uh, examples of why certain aspects of my work may look in a certain way. But uh, the explosion of creation is what Red Genesis is all about. And it's, it's not just uh, back then or it's happening all the time. It's happening in art. It's happening in the painting. It's happening where one form will uh, change and give rise to another form, or fuse mm -hmm. into a, a form and change uh, in itself. And I'm not thinking, oh, this looks like this is going to be more like a fish. Or I'm not thinking realistically or representationally. I'm thinking of shape and paint and, and you know, phenomena and, and color and then uh, if it happens to look like something you know it doesn't bother me it may bother some people but doesn't bother me uh, I'm just creating a painting where it ends up and what idiom it ends up uh, isn't you know my main concern you know I think sometimes movements and, and art and ideas and art can get too restrictive I, I don't get a lot of my sense of uh, let's say color uh, ideas or sensibility from because I study the textbooks and I've gone through you know a site or you know, it's Chevro, I think I have a thick book on on his color theory uh, I'm more emotive and I think it, it's just the sense of looking at sometimes a tube of paint and saying wow look at that color getting it and saying I want to paint a picture that majors in this color, please. You so, say, well, let's try this. You get exasperated, and you try this, or you try that. Oh, oh, hey, wow, I'm on to something. <laughs> this is this is really good. And that'll that move, that brush stroke, that color, whatever. Uh, and a lot of times, it's it's how you use the color. Sometimes uh, watering it down, spraying a little bit of water on it, you know, it just causes it to drift a little bit. And, thin out and say, oh, now, yeah, soften the edge. Now, that's working. 
as opposed to having a harder edge on, on a shape. You know, um, it's, uh, it, it, there's all kinds of aspects uh, that come into play when you're creating how big, how small, uh, soft, you know, bright, you know, all these things. So, yeah, there's a lot of intellectual uh, reasoning that, and, and deciphering that has to go on when you're painting. or. When well, you're I think primarily we're here uh, talking about this because of the art, virtual art convention. Mm-hmm. And I'm glad they're still carrying on with that. And I think, especially at a time like this, we need <laughs> yes. uh, things not just for escape uh, purposes, but uh, just to enrich life, because that's what art does. It, it, it enriches life, and it does it in different ways for different people. Mm-hmm. But it still is an enrichment in some form or another. And, and with painting, I've had people come up and say, you know, I've had your painting for, for, you know, years, and I'm still seeing new things. You know, I, I, things I never saw. The light comes through mm-hmm. and hits it in a certain way. And wow, you know, so we, we get so much joy out of your stuff. You know, uh, and, and people coming in saying, you know, to, to, I come home from a hard day at the office and I'm just totally tired. I flop down in the, in the Chesterfield and, with my drink, and, and I look at Paul's painting, and it, it makes me feel all the tightness and all the knots inside me just dissipate and drift away. It makes me feel so good. And, you know, if, if that's uh, all I end up doing for in society is helping people's stress levels dissipate, you know, that's not a bad thing. 